Hi, it's Chuck Sachs of Indie Opera Podcast, beginning a new series called Interviews from the Void. These are interviews that happened last year and never got released. The first one is about Julie, an opera film created by New Camerata Opera. Since the release of Julie in June 2020, the film has been an official selection of the Concepcion Independent Film Awards in Chile and the Sound and Vision International Film and Technology Festival, where it was an awarded and an honorable mention in the feature-length category. It has gathered thousands of views on New Camerata Opera's YouTube channel, and the work continues to attract attention. It is up for consideration at several more festivals as we mark the one-year anniversary of its release. Please enjoy. Hello, welcome everyone. This is Chuck Sachs for Indie Opera Podcast, and I'll be talking today with some of the artists who have created Julie, a new opera film, which received its world premiere via YouTube on June 4th. This film was produced by New Camerata Opera as part of the Camerata Works program. So, who is joining me today? Eric. Yes, <laughs> my name is Eric Bagger. Um, I'm a co-founder of New Camerata Opera, but uh, within the context of this production, uh, I was co-director of photography and co-lighting director with my colleague Paul, with whom you'll hear from later. Um, and I was also very fortunate uh, and lucky to be in the cast as Le Duc de Saint uh, Certe Fanitaire. Um, nice big long French name. Yes. <laughs> uh, and Paul, hello. Yes, hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Paul Ashey. I had the pleasure of being uh, Eric's uh, co-lighting director and also co-director uh, of photography for Julie. Um, and I had an absolute blast. It was great. And Whitney? Yeah, uh, my name is Whitney George. I am the, the composer. Um, and that is, uh, oh, of course, and the conductor as well. I guess I did do that as well. Yes, yes you did. <laughs> <laughs> and Chloe. Hi, I'm Chloe Treat, and I am the director of Julie. And then we're joined by Greg Mumshi, who is the critic and musicologist for Indie Opera Podcast. Mm -hmm. Hi, Greg. So I'm excited to talk about this. Um, of course, now my internet connection goes is unstable. It's like, thank you, Spectrum. But it sounds like auto tune. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Let me start with my, my first question is, did New Camerata Opera commission this new work? Or who or what was the original impetus? Any, who, anyone, go ahead, Eric. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I guess speaking on behalf of NCO, yeah, we, uh, we did commission this piece. Um, we had worked with Whitney uh, three times prior on main stage produ pr uh, productions. And um, it was actually after a rehearsal for the opera Divide Light. Uh, which is by uh, Richard Marriott and Leslie Dill, mm -hmm. uh, which we premiered at Dixon Place in spring of 2018. Um, after one of those rehearsals, which Whitney conducted and uh, 
uh, led the ensemble, the Curiosity Cabinet, in the performances, um, we sort of casually brought this project up hypoth hypothetically to, to her. And uh, we were very excited about it. She was very excited about it. And that kind of snowballed from there. Cool. And how long did it take between that decision to commission and then to create and then produce and then premiere? About how long was that process? The whole process, recently I, I went on our uh, Google Drive and uh, for NCO and I looked at the Julie um, folder that we had created and it was November 7th, 2017. So this has been in the works for, for, for a pretty long time. Um, we uh, finished up, we had the, the recording of the audio in, in fall of 20, uh, 2019, I should mm -hmm. say. And then we ended up shooting um, the film over the course of a week in late January, 2020. Um, yeah, so, so it, was pretty much, it was a very long period of time. So, uh, but un under three yeah. years, which is still, that's amazing. And, uh, yeah. and <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, so let's go to Whitney and Chloe. So were you, did you have sit down and discussions about this? How did we come around to the project itself? Uh, well, I was given a, a, a text by the librettist, of course, um, mm -hmm. and the three of us gathered around to have a discussion on, um, w you know, what we envisioned some of um, the librettist ideas to kind of look like. And I had at that point, um, I, it also it had a couple of samples of music of some musical ideas and motifs that I was mm -hmm. I was playing with. So that was a part of our initial discussion um but a, a lot of um certainly my musical work was was done um uh, you know just with the the work of the, uh, just based on the text and um in, in tr attempting to envision the the text myself but not trying to impose that that vision on what chloe wanted to do you know um because that's that's not my domain that's the that's uh -huh. the domain of the director for sure yes and, and i mean i read through the score today so there are a lot of stage directions that are occurring that uh frequently take the place of dialogue because as as we know film is a visual medium so how did you go about with that um working with that chloe well you know one of the biggest challenges and i think opportunities in this um in this specific story is that it's a it's a hugely ambitious libretto um you know, it's the, I, I wasn't sure what NCO's kind of operating budget was, but when I first, <laughs> I received the libretto in a pretty fully realized way. And when I saw it, I was like, carriages and castles and ballrooms. Like, <laughs> I don't know what you all have at your disposal, but that's, that's quite a lot. So, you know, um, immediately something that was really exciting for me directorially was thinking about, how we could use theatrical abstraction to our benefit to tell this really incredibly dramatic story. Um, and because film is a medium that does that really beautifully, I feel like um, some of the kind of fiscal limitations and um, logistical limitations that we had ended up really being gifts and opportunities. Wow. And uh, so- Yeah, the, uh, yeah. our carriage is a little- the uh, the the one thing we have at NCO three initiatives one is our main stage productions one is uh, children's opera through Camerata mm -hmm. Piccola and the third is Camerata Works which are film products um, and the only one that doesn't really have a monetary return at, at least at this point is um, Camerata Works our film projects mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's really for the company a, a complete labor of love and. Um, very often we're working with shoestring budgets in comparison to really what is needed for for um, for operatic film because opera is is hard enough and expensive enough to produce on its own but then when you're putting it in the studio to record the audio and then shooting it on location and getting all that right and the, ed the editing and the lights and all mm -hmm. the other variables that come in it just uh, makes it even more challenging <laughs> physically. And it, was this the, the full length of the work you were expecting or 
is there a longer version, a, a stage version of this that's potentially in the works? Well, originally, um, the, the piece was to be actually shorter. It was supposed to be about 10 minutes long. <laughs> um, but Julie's life is so colorful and this particular um, story from her life uh, is, is so chock full of action um, that it sort of necessitated a little bit more of an expansion um, just to really do it justice. Um, and that was something that Whitney, George, and Wallace Dark, our librettist, and Chloe, which we were very fortunate to have Chloe on in the beginning of the process, um, uh, they brought to us as a proposal um, for a different way that the structure could be set up. And so that's how we ended up with the with the 27 minute short film. Mm -hmm. And uh, where'd my question go? Uh, Chloe. Yes. <laughs> um, so give us, can you give us a brief, the audience, a brief explanation of the story of the, the opera at, that we see? Yeah, so the story that we see um, tracks a, a young woman named Julie, who um, is this kind of incredible chameleon who is ahead of her time. Um, and we meet her as a performer, dueler, lover, doer of all things. Um, she, uh, during a performance, she's an opera singer, and during a performance, she um, kisses a woman who is in her, who is in the audience. Um, and this is scandalous for many reasons, one of them being that it's a woman, and one of them being that it's kind of like someone highborn who belongs to, uh, you know, who's fianced to someone important, blah, blah, blah. Um, she is challenged to many duels because of this action. She kicks ass at the duels because she is a badass. Um, and then she has a reunion with this woman who she has this kind of illicit love affair with. So that's the basics. Now, can, <laughs> Cl the basics. I know. Simple. can Chloe, uh, <laughs> Eric, and, um, and Paul discuss, talk about the process of actually bringing this to life on film? Um, I know that you were able to get a space through Shashama that was um, on Roosevelt Island, and it was... a a closed parking lot or was it just closed for that time sort of a very open parking lot <laughs> <laughs> i know I, I watched the opera and you could see cars passing by the windows at one point <laughs> they were also on either side of the frame they were also pas you know mm -hmm. just quietly telling people to to step around it was it was good it was a wonderful operation so it was still being used at <laughs> all those cars time. were perfectly placed <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, how did you go about choosing the specific areas uh, in terms to stage everything and then that after that to light and, and, and photograph that? Well, I think how it kind of started is I, upon getting, upon receiving the completed libretto, as I kind of hinted toward earlier, was like, okay, I don't think we're actually going to have a stable and a ballroom unless you all have something really tricky up your sleeve. So I think something that might be exciting is to use a space that feels like it can be highly adaptable. And I had, um, there's a music video called This Is America that takes place in a, in a warehouse and, and you're traversing the warehouse. And I was also thinking of the film Anna Karenina where um, an empty theatrical space is used as um, the the side of action for different things, and so I was I was asking these gentlemen if there was some kind of um, bare space that we could really be creative and transformative with. And I think as we especially got to see the kind of rich, deeply textured, deeply time specific costumes that were going to be available to us, the idea of putting that in front of something quite bare felt exciting in terms of contrast and just aesthetic. So I think that's kind of where the search for a space started. Um, and I handed that idea off to these gentlemen. And then I don't know, what did you two do? Well, um, we saw a number of, of different venues, different uh, options. Um, some that were outside of the scope of our budget um, yeah. to rent for the entirety of a whole week. Mm -hmm. um, because 
we really need a lot of shooting time to get all the footage and all the, the different takes and have lots of options mm -hmm. in the editing room. Um, so we really needed that much time, particularly to, to whittle it down to 27 minutes of, of film in the end. Um, so we had worked with uh, an organization called Shishama, which you mentioned earlier. Um, it's uh, basically, it's, it's spearheaded by Anita Durst of the Durst organization. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fantastic organization that works mostly with uh, visual artists in pairing them with uh, places to present, usually uh, gallery space, or it can also be um, spaces to be used for, for studio. I, I've um, had various and uh, basically and, uh, the, the Durst organization. Yeah, I've had various friends, yeah. theater companies who have gotten spaces like that. It's kind of, you know, they do site specific work and this exactly. would kind of be semi site specific in a sense. Yeah, exactly. Well, we, we had done a series of concerts with them before. And um, so I approached them and asked if they might have an, a, a large uh, big industrial space that we could utilize for this um, with lots of little nooks and, and opportunities that might be uh, cinematic. And, uh, and they came back to us with this, this space, which was actually a relatively new space in their collection. Mm -hmm. um, and they permitted it for us and they worked with um, the uh, public safety department out on Roosevelt Island mm -hmm. to make sure that it, everything was good uh, on that front. And uh, they made sure our, our, our power wattage was decent um, for all of our mm. lights, despite some problems that we had on that front. Um, and uh, yeah, they really, really helped us out a lot and uh, got us that whole space donated for the entire week. And it's cool and then, because- And then Chloe, Chloe and I toured mm -hmm. the, the space and Paul as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's cool because it has so many, I mean, you'd have to build everything to get that many uh, different heights and, and, and kind of different spaces to work with. And I just want to mention, uh, your costumer was the wonderful Angela Huff, mm -hmm. who I've had the chance to work with through when I worked with New Encompass New Opera Theater. And that was fascinating. I mean, to see this difference between these much more period appropriate costumes, as opposed to the very, in, you know, contemporary industrial space. Mm -hmm. So, um, Paul, how did, I mean, definitely Eric needed a co-person here because he was performing. So how did all of that work? I mean, did you just keep, <laughs> did you, when it came to actual production, were you mostly in charge at that point or? Well, the, the beautiful thing about the whole crew in general for, for Julie is everybody was just kind of doing multiple jobs at once it was this wonderful balancing act where you know everybody was kind of seeing what was happening to the right and to the left and to the front and to the back so eric would just jump on screen and then i would go take over the lights and then you know we'd have someone coming in for the day lighting up the other side and um it was it was almost a a performance in and of itself behind the camera uh, everyone jumping around and um yeah, it, it, <clears throat> I think that honestly, we're talking about how amazing the space was. It also kind of made it easy for us to, to light and, and photograph everything in a compelling way because it was so vast and there's so many levels and um, gosh, the, the symmetry and the repeating structures just added this whole beautiful visual layer to everything. Um, it, it, was, it was really a, a, a treat it was almost mm -hmm. like we had our work cut out for us visually, you know, in a lot of ways. I think in this space, I, I, I think so much about kind of like freshman directing 101. <laughs> we talk about limitations and how often limitations are so um, helpful and fruitful to the creative process. And, you know, I don't think with endless resources, anyone would have picked this parking garage in Roosevelt Island <laughs> to film <laughs> this, this piece in. Um, but it was just cinematographically, cinemat mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. not a word. It photographed so beautifully. Mm -hmm. It was so photogenic. Mm -hmm. The light was exquisite. Mm -hmm. um, so many it was freezing cold but that meant that there was like mist coming out of people's mouths which is beautiful like so many of the things that we probably wouldn't have picked 
ended up right. serving us um, really well. And I felt like it ended up being, you know, of course we did a ton of planning, but then because of that, a huge amount of it ended up being like looking at what was naturally working in any given moment in the space and improvising and being flexible mm -hmm. and taking advantage of that. And I think we were lucky enough to have a kind of small, flexible, homegrown enough crew that there was room for that kind of flexibility mm -hmm. as well. So now, was everything completely recorded uh, beforehand in November? And so everyone was in a sense lip syncing? Yes. Or was there any live singing happening? All beforehand. And so in a sense, Whitney, so all your work had to be done before. You, were you there on set also just in case of anything? Or were you just no. off eating, you know, I, I was unfortunately warm. However, I will I will tell you the second I saw all the pictures of everyone in period costume, I was like, I should have been there. I should have. <laughs> I should have. That was. I missed my calling in such a profound way. I, I even have a costume that would have like really slipped in rather nicely, like just as, as sitting in my closet. Seafoam <laughs> green tails suit or tails coat and a. A gold pair of pants. Anyway, um, so no, but um, I'm I'm really a fan of letting people um, r uh, letting go of control of of um, the sort of vision is is um, a very uh, nerve wracking thing, but also very <laughs> exciting. And in my uh, conversations, even early on with Chloe, I got the great sense that I should really trust her creative impetus and drive mm -hmm. and. Um, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even concerned knowing that they were filming and like that I wasn't there. I said, you know, she's going to do whatever she needs to do. And I, and trust me, when I, when I set the text, there were many moments where I was like, wow, I wonder if this actually is going to happen in terms of the final product. But that's also not my air. That's not my area a hundred percent either. And so that idea of that, that give and take is really quite, mm -hmm. quite beautiful. So um, I think my presence, while I would have been uh, fun and perhaps obnoxious, uh, I, I, it, I, I, I'm glad that I wasn't there to inform any of the decisions because when I saw the final product, I was just blown away. Uh, Very yeah, it's like, it sounds great to me. It's like, there are points where it's like, you know, I'm really happy with the rehearsal process and doing this work. And then there's points where it's like, can someone else play this performance? It's like, yeah. I, I, I like the process of everything. And then it's just like, you just take over, okay? And I could have stuck in there too, because I have a Jacobean doublet and the shirt and uh, all of the outfit that would work in that period too. You needed more extras. Where were you two? I know, man. I had no idea. Had I known, um, so so often I'm involved uh, in almost every single aspect of the productions that I do. So yeah. in the opportunity that I really trust the collaborators that I'm working with, I really like to to let them run away with things. And I, um, for for that reason, that was that was particularly exciting. Um, you know, after hand, you know, sort of dusting my hands off clean, uh, you know, in November and being like, well, it's someone else's, um, it, you know, job to, to paint what I've, what I've made acoustically, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, it was I, I, a decision, it, I, 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 good, a good decision to, mm -hmm. to take, take steps back. Well, Greg had wanted me ask the difference you found between composing opera for the stage versus for film. Sure. Um, so, I uh, there's a huge difference. Um, well, I don't know about that. I, so in, I guess a couple of thoughts, like in, in our initial conversations and the idea of like having Julie be a 10 minute scene and her being such like a larger than life character, um, uh, you know, 10 minutes to set an idea musically feels like absolutely no time at all. Mm -hmm. That's like one sort of vignette. However, 10 minutes in time for film is forever. That's actually a very long time, 10 minutes. Is it? So like the, the speed of the two mediums and kind of the, the pace in which they work is completely against one another. Film works really, really, really fast, but music actually works really slowly. Um, and much, so thinking about that, especially when, you know, I was, I was handed these whole sections of like, 
montage sequence. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to imagine how long this montage sequence might last and figuring out like kind of flexibility in that regard was um, totally different than doing something, um, than doing something, you know, on stage. Kind of related to your question, but a little bit tangential. Um, so I, I had, I was working on Princess Malen, like rehearsing it while mm -hmm. finishing Julie. So I was in the midst of doing like, a, a, like, you know, rehearsing and conducting a live theatrical performance of the same kind of, you know, operatic medium. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, right. So there's a lot of compositional bleed and some like interesting ideas and connectivity between those two pieces, just because they were, um, sort of composed and worked on alongside of one another. So mm -hmm. two very, very different uh, uh, expressions of the same kind of, I guess, medium that we're talking about opera. So they're hugely different though, mostly because that idea of time and how it's elapsing. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like when I've been composing musicals, uh, I'm also a former dancer choreographer. So when ah. it comes to sequences like that, I have some sense of what, you know, a shape of something could be, but I, I also can sit down with the choreographer and, and talk and then and modify as, as needed, but also be able to give them a palette to go from and say, here, go play, uh, which is, you know, usually more composers are like, no, this is what it is and that's what you get and go use that. It's, um, that's a rarity I know that actually have a composer who's who's a choreographer, but uh, it does, it's been fun that way. Um, the the yeah. idea though, that like, like um, I think vamps and stuff can more easily exist in like theatrical or stage productions to like mm -hmm. accommodate the necessities of, of live theater. But each step along the way when doing filmed opera is fixed, like you can't go backwards. So mm -hmm. like, you know, as much as I wanted to be like, well, this fight sequence can last anywhere between this many seconds and this many seconds. Like ultimately, like a decision just has to be made as to how long it's going to be. Um, and like, again, working within those those constraints um, can breed some interesting creativity. Cause I'm sure, I'm sure there were points where Chloe was like, I wish this whole section was like maybe 10 seconds shorter here or like, or like, I wish like I had a little bit more music here to finish out this particular moment. So, you know, that's the, those are just kind of the the, the nuances and, and the results that happen as, as um, mm -hmm. because of the people that you're working with. It was so, really interesting. Yeah. Oh, Go ahead. It was really interesting for me because um, I am very much a, a stage director. Um, this is the biggest film project I've ever done and, you know, I feel like to, towards what Whitney is saying, I have a really good sense when I pre-pro theater, like these four bars will be them crossing and then they'll pick this up. Like I have a, a really good mm -hmm. sense of how, how much action you'll need to captivate an audience. Um, and, you know, obviously I did pre-production in, in this a, a similar way, but, you know, different for the medium for this thing. But I feel like we really did learn in editing specifically um, the moments where it's like, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, our brains with film are just so used to seeing the screen move so quickly. Mm -hmm. And there were moments where just even like a, a musical phrase that is sung long on film felt like we were staying in one place too long. So I mm -hmm. do feel like we ended up um, learning so much and I think making some really exciting creative choices uh, in the editing process to kind of accommodate mm -hmm. what Whitney is is talking about. Um, and I'm sure that's something that if you do more and more opera film, you get a better <laughs> sense of. Um, but yeah, the the how long your ear wants to hear a phrase versus how long your eye wants to rest on a mm -hmm. single um, image, I think is is often in contrast with each other in this medium. Yeah, and I, I think like Chloe and I would have, you know, been playing darts in the dark on on maybe even knowing like, <laughs> so I think of like a post-mortem, like, oh man, I, I, I can't tell you how much I would have killed for 45 seconds less music here or more here would be really, but it's always going to, of course, change 
project by project, like mm -hmm. uh, collaborator and collaborator. It, it just, um, there's so many variables, but yes, practice makes perfect. Right, because the difference with reg no regular film is that the score is being written along the way, but it comes in after the movie mm -hmm. already has had a, a major draft done. And yeah. you're, you've got that timer, that clicker going, all right, mm -hmm. and that's when you find out, okay, this has to be shorter, this has to be longer, and all that process goes on because it's meant to fit the, the existing visual, where in this case, the visual had to fit the existing score because yep. there, was no, there was not time and ability to do um, re-editing on that. Now, I how- My brain, I think that's, I, I can't imagine how, like, well, Whitney is saying darts in the dark. Yeah. I don't know. If we were trying to do both things at once, I think it would have been right. impossible. And going yeah. back to this idea of limitations, I think it was so great to just be like, this is the roadmap. We'll figure out what happens on top of it because it does, it works incredibly musically. So, mm -hmm. so then we can um, assess and adjust on top of that. And, and how long did the whole process take of filming it? I mean, how long were the days... Uh, there are three scenes in the piece. And so were you one day each scene or what was the process of that? It Eric, was, Paul? Uh, well, we scheduled, we had a full seven days um, mm -hmm. at the venue and they were all eight hour blocks. Um, and we did a doodle poll with the cast um, and determined when we would have certain groups of folks that we needed for certain scenes right and their schedule just as you would for a stage production um and it was generally like uh, a, a half day per chunk of a scene um and we had to factor in time of course for changing in and out of costume and makeup and wigs and um you know also not be so cramped time-wise that people couldn't you know have a cup of coffee and reflect mm -hmm. and uh, take a break um, right, so we did you have right. 11 performers in this. Yeah. I mean, uh, seven leads in a sense and four ensemble. Mm -hmm. And there Absolutely. are sequences where it's everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was tough um, schedule wise, yeah. uh, as it often is um, for, for productions in general. Um, and it was also pretty challenging because uh, we already mentioned it, but it was so cold <laughs> there at the venue. So we had to make some some holding tents also for people to change um, so that they're not changing in the middle of a parking lot. Um, and we had some space heaters in there, but the, the two space heaters we had couldn't be on at the same time as the instant pot that had the oatmeal and because we had all the wattage from the, 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 the lamps and things in the, that were running, it was a, it was a <laughs> delicate balance uh, that we, so that we didn't, you know, uh, trip a circuit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we made it work and we're very, very fortunate to have had a super flexible um, cast, super mm -hmm. flexible, super game, mm -hmm. just really, really awesome cast that, that kind of rolled with, rolled with the schedule and the challenges that it presented. Yeah. Uh, and so we ended up wrapping one day early. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it, Paul, and, and so how many cameras did you have working on this and how many different areas were lit? And did that oh, wow. change per day? That's a very good question. So kind of also springing off of the, the scheduling uh, question too, we, on top of everything else, you know, there was also uh, the sun and the fact that like this whole garage was like very, just windows everywhere. So a lot of, uh, a lot of the scheduling was also based around where the sun was in the sky. So there's always this clock that we had, you know, driving mm -hmm. us towards completing things. Right. <clears throat> um, but uh, yeah, I, we, we worked originally, we came in with, I, I believe three cameras, is that right, Eric? We had the three, three different cameras um, <clears throat> and we had tripods, uh, we had um, kind of motion uh, like stability gimbals mm -hmm. that we were using as well. Um, but we kind of favored these really nice structural um, static shots um, on tripods a lot of the time, which was great. Um, but yeah, there was just, there was a lot. There were at, at any given moment, I think the fight scene kind of pops into my mind. We've got <clears throat> one person with an iPhone on a gimbal, like on the ground, 
you know, like shooting up into the fight and then someone else on the stairs with a camera on the tripod. And it was just, it was very, it was very fun. It was very active. Paul was also doing all of this on crutches, like a oh, superhero. I, had, like, I forgot about that. Fully <laughs> bundled in winter time on oh, wow. crutches. And we'd, we'd load in and out into a van every single night. And we're like, Paul, you can you can go home. You don't have to help us load out. And he's like, no, I want to help. And he's like carrying like a box. To right. The- so that, that was another part of your production that you had to load in and load out every day. Almost like yes. since you were on tour. It's like new place. Build it up. That that's that's not fun crazy. at all. No, so <laughs> so um so it premiered on June fourth on YouTube and that's where it's you can find it now on the new Camarada Opera YouTube channel. What are the next mm-hmm. hopes for this piece? Well, we've started submitting it uh to festivals uh as a as a short film. Uh, Actually, one of the six festivals we've submitted so far, it was too long for what they considered a short, so we submitted it as a feature, which is crazy. Um, But but for most of the festivals, it it falls within the short category. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, otherwise, we're just trying to get as as, as many views as possible on YouTube and try to, Mm -hmm. you know, we made it so that people could see it and so that people, so that we could tell Julie's story and also... Fortunately, it felt really sort of uh, therapeutic to present opera right now uh, mm-hmm. in this climate that because of the pandemic, there's a void to some degree. And I would um, suggest- we were very, very fortunate with respect to timing. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I, and you know, so I that would was- suggest uh, you might submit it to Opera Omaha because part of their annual festival, which as we didn't happen this year, is an mm-hmm. opera um, and music on film that they oh, do great. at a refurbished uh, old uh, film film house, uh, usually with live music. But I I could see them being interested in this because they don't those great. pieces yeah. don't have to be full length at all. You know, they can be shorts like this. Um, mm-hmm. And so yeah, I would definitely suggest contacting them. Uh, and you can great. you can say Chuck Sachs said you know suggested this because. I've got a, a good acquaintance going on with them. Okay. Uh, they're definitely, Thank you. there are other places that, I mean, you can, that should be interested in this, that's for sure. It was really exciting and really, I really love the visual and, and the, as it's, it's kind of, as Chloe writes in her, no, um, her interview and notes, it's, it's got this kind of backstage element to it that you're seeing uh, Julie backstage and getting prepared and then, it goes in and out of that. And that, that's fascinating too. And yeah, one of the things that excited me about her story from the beginning that I really wanted to lean into was this idea that she was a performer, not just in profession, but in life. And it feels like she was someone who was thinking about gender identity as a performance um, and kind of, you know, now we live in this age where everybody has a, has a brand, has a brand and a, and a self, <laughs> um, a, a self-realized kind of marketing angle. But I think she was kind of thinking about those ideas of performance, of personhood um, in an exciting way. And it felt like there was some metaphor to be, um, to be explored there mm-hmm. with that kind of backstage element of the film. And Whitney, I- do you think maybe you'll go back to the subject matter and go and create a full length? Because she definitely lived a fascinating life. You know, she did, but I cannot even tell you the, the list of things that I want to make into <laughs> operas at this, at this point. Um, the list is over a hundred subjects long. Um, I, I also, um, I feel like sometimes I get, um, uh, uh, perhaps Bill for doing like kind of period things, which I, I really do love doing, but mm-hmm. would also be interested in doing something a little bit more modern. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it, is Julie's story completely told in an operatic form? Absolutely not. May I revisit her at some point? Absolutely. Um, 
there's only one operatic project that I've revisited in the past. Again, I felt like I've lived my existence for you know decades upon decades upon decades as a composer, but The Yellow Wallpaper got a huge facelift when I uh, redid it for a uh, fresh squeezed opera. Um, Julie might get a similar treatment, you know, a, a decade from, from now, uh -huh. who, who knows. Um, it definitely was written with that, that idea of flexibility and, um, you know, uh, expanding her story in, in mind. Um, so there's a possibility. Okay. Well, this has been fascinating and I ask, tell everyone, go watch Julie. It really is a phenomenal, <laughs> piece of opera on film. And thank you, Eric, Paul, Chloe, Whitney, and, and Greg. And this has been Chuck Sachs for Indie Opera Podcast. And have a good night and stay safe and well. Thank you.